2011 began a dark period for the U.S. Human Space Launch Program. With the tragic destruction of the Columbia shuttle in 2003, the tough decision was made to retire the entire shuttle system without a viable replacement in sight. For the first time since 1961, the United States would be without a way of sending someone into space. For nearly the next decade, the U.S. would have to rely on Russia for its rides to the International Space Station at a pretty premium cost. NASA announced that this status quo would finally come to a close with the SpaceX Dragon capsule and Boeing's Starliner. These projects would develop together to give competition and options to the U.S. and other customers. In November 2020, I stood on a beach and watched as the Dragon first reopened U.S. human spaceflight. And now, two years later in 2022, Boeing has announced that they are delaying their capsule yet again. Today, we will talk about what went wrong and what will happen from here. This and all the rest happening in the world of space today, welcome to the Undiscovered Country. Hello and welcome fellow citizens to the Undiscovered Country. I'm your host, Bryant A.M. Baker. Today, I'll present the top five most important things happening in the world of space. This is a young channel illustrated perfectly by this comment. Frankly, I'm not sure how you found me either, but if you did, I thank you. I'm glad you're here, and I hope that this will be useful for you. Let's get started. Number five. The second all-private International Space Station mission now has a complete crew assigned to it. Of note, NASA and Houston-based company Axiom Space have confirmed two Saudi astronauts will join the SpaceX mission. AX-2 will send four people to the International Space Station. Angela Hart, manager of NASA's Commercial LEO Development Program, stated at an event that the names of the two Saudis on the flight are not public knowledge, but that they are working very hard with them on training already. AX-2 previously already had two crew members on board, retired NASA astronaut Peggy Whitson in command, and John Schaffner, a race car driver and airshow pilot, who paid for his seat as the pilot of the mission. Following some scheduling problems on Axiom's side that required NASA to provide a space station astronaut to complete work on AX-1 work, NASA introduced requirements to have all Axiom missions led by a former agency astronaut. The mission is targeted for a spring 2023 arrival at the ISS and will also open the curtain in the burgeoning Saudi astronaut program. It was only six weeks ago that Saudi Arabia announced that it has started an astronaut program and planned to send two people to space, including at least one woman. These won't be the first Saudi citizens in space, as already one man has achieved orbit. Uh, Prince Sultan bin Sal Salman Al Saud, who flew on the STS-51G mission of the Space Shuttle Discovery in 1985. The inclusion of a woman, however, is notable, as Saudi women tend to enjoy far fewer rights than their male counterparts. Space.com cited, for example, that Saudi women were forbidden to even drive cars until as late as 2018. What are your thoughts on this latest announcement? Number four. Question. What happens when the densest, most massive stars that are also super small collide? Answer. They send out brilliant explosions known as kilonova. NASA has announced that scientists will soon have an additional observatory to help follow up on and even scout these remarkable events. 
NASA's Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which is set to launch by May of 2027. The key actors in Kilanova are neutron stars, the central cores of stars that collapsed under gravity during supernova explosions. They each have a mass similar to the Sun, but are only about six miles in diameter. And when they collide, they send out debris moving nearly at the speed of light. These explosions are also thought to forge heavy elements like gold, platinum, and uh, strontium, which gives actual fireworks their, their stunning red colors. Kilanova shoot those elements across space, potentially allowing them to end up in rocks forming the crust of terrestrial planets like the Earth. NASA's Roman Space Telescope will survey the same areas of the sky every few days following its launch. Researchers will mine these data to identify Kilanova. The astronomical community captured one of these remarkable Kilanova events in 2017. Scientists at the National Science Foundation's Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or, or LIGO, detected the collision of two neutron stars first with gravitational waves, which are ripples in space-time. But the players in this example collided practically in our backyard, at least in astronomical terms. Soon, researchers will know far more about these kilonova about where these kilonova occur and how often these explosions occur in the history of the universe. Were those that occurred earlier different in some way? Roman will allow the astronomy community to begin conducting population studies along with a slew of new analysis on the physics of these explosions. Number three. The first space launch system rocket made the 6.7 kilometer trip from High Bay 3 in the Vehicle Assembly Building, or VAB, out, back out to Launch Complex 39B on Thursday night into Friday morning. This will be the seventh roll of the rocket stack, which had to seek safety and cover from approaching Hurricane Ian in, in late September. The move follows a five-week stay at the VAB to shelter from the hurricane and allow teams to prepare the vehicle for its next launched attempt. While NASA officials stressed in a media teleconference on November 3rd that the agency's highly anticipated Artemis 1 moon mission will be challenging, they stated they are confident in the upcoming launch attempt scheduled for November 14th. NASA officials stressed in the day's media briefing that they stand behind the new mission timeline, which aims for a launch attempt at 12.07 a.m. Eastern Time on the 14th. Jim Free, the Associate Administrator for the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C., stated that if we weren't confident, we wouldn't roll it out. If we weren't confident, we wouldn't start the countdown when, when we do so. We're confident moving forward. Now, while SLS has been in the VAB for the past five weeks, NASA engineers have been replacing SLS flight termination system hardware, recharging Orion's batteries, and replacing payload batteries, including the ones in some of the mission's 10 ride-along CubeSats. When asked whether the countless delays in the SLS has had an effect on morale, Mr. Free explained that these are a professional group of people whose first allegiance is to the hardware and doing things right. And when we give you all the discussions like this, I appreciate the questions and the ability to kind of address things like you just said, the criticisms that are thrown our way. Um, however, we're spending taxpayer dollars. We, we should be open to criticism and answering questions, but it will never put us in the place of pushing too hard to launch too fast or making a bad decision. Number two. Next, an update out of a story I covered a few days ago, which you should definitely go and check out. A large rocket stage used to launch the final module for China's space station made an uncontrolled re-entry into the atmosphere on Friday. 
According to the U.S. Space Command, the roughly 21 metric ton dry mass Long March 5B rocket stage re-entered over the South Central Pacific Ocean at 6.01 a.m. Eastern on November 4th, just over four days after its launch. The re-entry event had been tracked by U.S. and European authorities, which provided predictions for the re-entry. China's Human Spaceflight Agency regularly released orbital data updates for the rocket stage, but provided no predictions along the way. China launched the third and final module for its Tiangong space station with the fourth Long March 5B rocket on October 31st. The Mengqian module successfully docked with the station 13 hours later. A section of airspace over northern Spain was closed early Friday based on a bulletin issued by the European Aviation Safety Agency on November 3rd based on predictions from the EU space surveillance and tracking. France also closed airspace south of Corsica from 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. local time. However, predictions varied widely because objects in low Earth orbit travel at nearly 8 kilometers per second, meaning a deviation of even a few minutes means a re-entry more than a thousand kilometers away. Even before the re-entry, it was estimated that there was a 99.5% chance that there would be zero casualties. But according to Ted Mulehaupt, a consultant with the Aerospace Corporation's Corporate Chief Engineer's Office, that's high enough that the world has to watch and prepare and take precautionary steps that has a cost which is unnecessary. Most of the rocket stage burned up during the high-speed re-entry into the atmosphere, but a portion of it reached the surface of the Earth. A recent Nature Astronomy paper published stated that the Long March 5B reentry is a large and prominent symptom of a wider problem. Current practices mean there's a 10% chance of an uncontrolled reentry causing one or more casualties over the next decade. China's next apparent scheduled use of the Long March 5B is to launch the Shunqian Observatory around late 2023 or 2024. Number one. Now let's talk about Boeing. NASA has delayed the first flight of Boeing's CST-100 Starliner commercial crew vehicle with astronauts on board yet again. This slip will push back the spacecraft's first operational mission to at least 2024. NASA said on November 3rd that the Crew Flight Test, or CFT, mission with agency astronauts Barry Butch Wilmore and Suni Williams on board was now scheduled for April 2023. The mission was previously planned for February. NASA said the new date avoids a conflict with SpaceX Crew-6 mission to the International Space Station, which is currently scheduled for launch in mid-February. However, at an October 27 meeting of NASA's Aerospace Safety Advisory Board, or I'm sorry, Advisory Panel, members raised doubts about the readiness of the vehicle for both CFT and later operational missions. Mark Mark Sarangelo, a member of the panel, stated that while it is unfortunate that the U.S. is one operating ISS crew launch provider, We need to continue to express our serious concern about the impact of ongoing delays of the CST-100 program on the commercial crew program. He noted that the orbital flight test to uncrewed test flight of Starliner in May produced a number of in-flight anomalies that need to be resolved before the crewed test. Additional testing of the latest version of its flight software will also be needed. There was also thruster problems on the uncrewed mission, but those were pretty well understood and in hand and aren't being characterized as anything major. But what do you think? Should this be a last straw? Or should we be looking at this as just another expected part of the development of a complicated system? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much for joining me. Links to all the stories that I've described are in the description below. 
the world of space law policy and business is changing so quickly and there's so much happening right now. If you missed what happened yesterday, be sure to check out the episode that I did covering it. I'd love to hear your thoughts on everything that I talked about here today. I'll see you again next time.